This podcast is not legal advice and should not be relied upon as such. You should always obtain legal advice about your specific circumstances. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Tax Records, the Hall and Wilcox Tax Team's podcast series. My name is Frank Inopoulos and I'm a partner in the tax team at Hall & Wilcox. In this episode, we're talking about the ATO's recent compliance activity and focus. I'm joined again by my colleague, Todd Bromwich, a senior associate in the tax team at Hall & Wilcox. Thanks, Frank. It's good to be back. Um, Anecdotally, we've seen a lot of our accountant referrers Uh, say that in the aftermath of COVID, ATO are ramping up their compliance activity again and taking uh, easing back that concessional approach they were having. So I think a lot of listeners will hopefully find this episode to be particularly relevant. Um, And one thing is that the ATO seems to have a lot of programs on recently, including the Top 500, Top 1000, Next 5000, Medium and Emerging, and the International Risk Programs. And I was hoping you could just uh, explain what the point of these programs are. Sure. Thanks, Todd. So these programs mostly stem from the ATO's Tax Avoidance Task Force. Uh, The idea behind the task force is to engage in targeted programs to not only investigate aggressive tax avoidance arrangements, but also uh, to encourage practices uh, amongst taxpayers to obtain and increase assurance and uh, the concept of justified trusts uh, for uh, private groups and high wealth individuals. And the concept of justified trust uh, basically suggests that taxpayers with good governance processes in place uh, who are compliant and pay the right amount of tax uh, will earn a degree of justified trust and should therefore be uh, treated Um, more appropriately and with greater leniency by the ATO. The ATO recently published uh, the Tax Avoidance Task Force highlights for 2020 to 2021. uh, And in that, it said that their total compliance activities generated over $3 billion over the year in tax liabilities and $1.25 billion in audit yield from large public groups and multinational corporations and wealthy individuals and private groups. So would you say these programs seem to be working? Well, I think the figures that you've quoted um, there, Todd, would suggest that these programs are working. But having said that, of course, we can't really uh, quantify what these liabilities would have been otherwise if these programs were not in place. So it is a, a tough thing to try and statistically measure the success of these programs uh, in dollar terms, but uh, obviously the ATO see these programs as yielding some success and yielding some fruit, uh, and the current plan is to continue uh, with uh, with these particular programs focused on these market segments. I do think, um, aside from the actual revenue collected, there's also been a somewhat happy side effect for the ATO of certainly encouraging better compliance procedures uh, overall and a more proactive approach to managing tax risk. And it's very often the case now that I'll tell clients to uh, proceed with a transaction or to document a particular uh, course of events or activities that they are carrying out uh, in a way which would actually um, withstand ATO scrutiny because ATO scrutiny should be expected. Oh, well, you and I, Frank, and others in our team at Hall & Wilcox do quite a bit of early stage and litigated tax disputes. Um, what are some of the key issues you're seeing out there for taxpayers? And does the ATO have any particular focus at the moment? Sure, Todd, you're exactly right. And um, in our practice, we have observed an increase focused by the ATO on uh, compliance and assurance programs for uh, private business and high net wealth taxpayers. The issues that are being examined by the ATO um, are uh, include trust resolutions and trust compliance, uh, sections 100A, 
and 99B, aggressive tax planning, uh, pre-transaction restructuring, uh, for example, uh, pre-transaction restructuring involving CGT rollovers, and uh, the application of the small business CGT concessions. Uh, these are areas that have um, that are complex and have always been uh, the source of um, audit and review uh, activity for the ATO, and we expect we expect this to continue uh, over the coming months and years. And of course, uh, as a follow-on from the release of the Pandora Papers, we uh, do expect that there will be increased uh, scrutiny of offshore transactions and of inbound and outbound uh, transfer of funds. And uh, we make the point in our first episode um, that the ATO's ability to identify and scrutinise uh, these transactions is better than it's ever been. Uh, you mentioned a couple of sections there, Section 99B and Section 100A. Could you just go into a bit more detail about what they are? Uh, so both 99B and 100A are um, specific anti-avoidance provisions that focus on uh, trusts. So uh, they're both very complicated provisions. So this is a uh, very much condensed summary, but um, in broad principle, Uh, Firstly, Section 99B uh, is a section that applies to treat um, a beneficiary who gets the benefit of trust funds uh, being applied on their behalf as being accessible um, on those trust funds unless it is an amount which originates in trust corpus. So for 99B, the relevant question, both legally and practically, is identifying what is and what comprises trust corpus. Now, Section 100A looks at trust distributions uh, as well. However, the way that Section 100A works is to uh, attack or cancel a present entitlement, uh, which is in favour of a particular beneficiary of a trust, where the circumstances are such that um, that beneficiary is not intended to have the true uh, financial benefit of that distribution. That's what the legislation refers to as a reimbursement agreement. And we see these um, two provisions arise a lot in a cross-border context, Uh, in particular, uh, Section 99B, where there's a foreign trust, uh, noting that 99B is not limited to foreign trusts, but uh, where there's a foreign trust that makes funds available or makes distributions to Australian resident beneficiaries. And we see 100A come into play a lot where Australian trusts or Australian resident trusts look to make um, foreign beneficiaries presently entitled in circumstances where uh, actual cash distributions are not made to foreign resident beneficiaries. One of the, um, one of the key things that crops up in the 100A matters is the exception, which is, you know, 100A doesn't apply where the arrangement uh, is entered into into the course of ordinary family or commercial dealings. And that's one of the things that uh, I think a lot of practitioners are hoping to see some guidance on in the upcoming ATO tax ruling on Section 100A, just because there's not really a lot of case law guidance out there. Is there any word on when that ruling might be released? Thanks, Todd. Um, And you are uh, uh, absolutely correct that uh, Section 100A is subject to an exception where a reimbursement arrangement is or um, can be characterised as an ordinary family or commercial dealing. And you're also correct that uh, we are waiting on the ATO to release a public ruling Uh, setting out uh, the Commissioner's view on uh, what circumstances uh, will, in the Commissioner's opinion, uh, meet the definition of an ordinary family or commercial dealing. In terms of the timing around that, um, it is uncertain at the present time. Uh, We understand that the ATO are waiting on the outcome of a uh, test case in the Federal Court before they issue and publish uh, their ruling. And um, while it is subject to that test case judgment being finalised and handed down, 
uh, there is an expectation that we might see the draft ruling in the later part of this year or the early part of next year. Well, in, in your experience, what are some of the main complexities or hurdles that taxpayers might face in a tax dispute where sections 99B or 100A are involved? Sure, Todd. Um, it all come down to one thing, really, and that is the taxpayer's evidence. Uh, and that is proving that what you say occurred um, actually did occur and proving it with um, sufficient documentary evidence. Uh, this is a real issue in Section uh, 99B. As I said um, earlier, uh, the exception to, to Section 99B is if the amount that uh, the beneficiary has had the benefit of originates in trust corpus or trust capital. Now, that sounds simple, but actually uh, tracing through and having documentary proof that an amount that has come out as a capital distribution actually originated in trust corpus on its way into the trust, so to speak, um, can be very difficult from an evidentiary point of view. Uh, I mean, is there, for example, documents that show the gifting of an amount of capital uh, into a particular trust? Um, is there any evidence that shows the amount of capital has been preserved in the trust and not um, reinvested or distributed elsewhere? And um, then is there evidence that the distribution to the beneficiary can be linked or connected to that initial foundational amount of trust corpus? There's also an added issue, and that is that um, from the perspective of the beneficiary, they can very much be at the mercy of the trustee in terms of getting this information, or the trust settlement may have occurred so many years ago and in a jurisdiction outside of Australia, that these records or this information, if it did exist, may be very hard for an Australian resident beneficiary to access or to obtain. And these issues were explored in a, an important case um, heard in the last um, few years of uh, Campbell and the Commissioner. Well, to the point of money coming in from overseas sources, uh, the ATO recently released an alert highlighting a concern that taxpayers are disguising foreign income as loans or gifts from overseas related parties. What should we be aware of there? So the ATO uh, recently issued taxpayer alert uh, TA 2021-2 uh, to highlight its concerns about arrangements that the ATO believe are designed to intentionally disguise taxable income as funds received by an Australian resident either as a gift or a loan or in some other form from a related overseas entity. So this taxpayer's alert focuses on intentionally fraudulent arrangements. Um, in every case, there are risks involved generally in having overseas persons or overseas entities make unexplained and crucially undocumented transfers of cash to a person uh, who is in Australia, even where uh, they are, in substance, genuine gifts or genuine loans. So if the ATO commences an audit and alleges that a payment um, that a taxpayer has received from overseas is an amount of income, uh, then all the ATO really has to do is assert that and allege that and then the burden of proof actually flips back to the taxpayer to establish that it is not. And if the taxpayer has no uh, contemporary documentation in place, they may find it very, very difficult to actually make out and prove their case. So a couple of bottom line points here. Um, if you or a client receive money transferred uh, to them from overseas sources, it is very important that the underlying legal substance of the transaction is carefully and contemporaneously documented by the parties so that there is objective evidence of the nature and the source of the payment. And if the payment is an amount which is or can be income and you are an Australian resident, then it must be declared on the Australian resident's um, income tax return. Uh, so an, an example of an amount which may be treated as income 
uh, will include uh, foreign dividends, uh, the capital gains or the proceeds from a capital gain from the disposal of uh, foreign shares uh, and other like distributions uh, from entities or from trusts. And noting that in the offshore world, uh, there are lots more and, and, and different kinds of entities uh, and legal structures to what we may be accustomed to uh, dealing with in Australia. So if one of our listeners or their clients is approached by the ATO or they think that some of today's discussion might be relevant to them, what should they do? So hopefully uh, some of today's discussion has um, helped to identify some of the risks and also what people can expect from an ATO scrutiny perspective uh, and some strategies to get ahead of those risks and put some planning in place, uh, particularly at the front end of a transaction when the actions that the um, taxpayer takes can still be controlled. So a couple of practical things. Um, If you are helping a client who is going to receive a gift or a loan um, from their offshore relatives, it happens very often in in wealthy families, uh, then it is really important to make sure that uh, those types of arrangements are carefully documented. Um, And there should be formal legal documentation, even though it could be a a, a, a transaction occurring within a family group. That is going to be really important. And and that shouldn't be done after the event. It should be done at or before the time that these uh, transactions are actually um, carried out. It's also important that we um, are appreciating some of the risk and some of the uh, nuance of these um, particular anti-avoidance provisions. You know, they are um, certainly 100A and um, 99B, which we've discussed today, are um, provisions that the ATO will um, very regularly um, have recourse to. Uh, The issues around these can be very complicated, both from a legal point of view and an evidentiary point of view. So uh, it is important that taxpayers and their advisors are informed and um, can identify these risks before transactions are entered into. Uh, In a case where um, a taxpayer may have, or their advisor has identified an issue, has identified a disclosure, particularly around uh, previously undeclared uh, offshore income, then uh, we'll repeat Uh, what we urged in our first podcast, and that is to uh, give serious consideration to making a voluntary disclosure. uh, Noting, of course, that one of the um, inducements or benefits of making a voluntary disclosure is that a taxpayer can receive a very significant reduction uh, to the amount of penalties uh, that would otherwise apply if there was an audit and uh, the shortfall was detected and assessed um, by the ATO. Thanks, Frank, and thanks, everybody, for listening in to today's episode. ATO compliance activity can bring up a range of different issues for taxpayers, so we hope you found this helpful. If you have any questions about what we've discussed today, please contact uh, a member of our tax team. You can find our details on our website, hallandwilcox.com.au, or you can connect with us on LinkedIn. Join us next week for episode three, where we'll be discussing payroll tax crackdowns around Australia and the recent case of Optical Superstore and Thomas and Nas cases. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate, review and follow our podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can subscribe on our website to be notified of new episodes. (laughs) 